Hi, you're watching Investor Insights and in this video I would like to discuss sound economic principles and how the US government and its Federal Reserve have got it all so wrong. Now first things first, if you were to look at uh, financial headlines around the globe at this point in time, you could be forgiven for thinking the world is just in a perfect place. Um, if you are involved in the stock market, you would be thinking that you're in a financial utopia. If you own real estate, you're going to be happy once again because prices are rising once more. And there's just a lot of happy chatter, a lot of backslapping on Wall Street, and a lot of people are making money once more. So, what seems to be the problem? Well, the problem goes much be goes much deeper than just looking at uh, rising asset prices. You've got to look at why asset prices are rising in the first place. And if you look beneath the surface, then you will find that the US economy is a ticking time bomb and the time on it is fast running out. Uh, a lot of economies around the world um, have a lot of debt on their hands and they're suffering as a consequence of having so much debt but none more so than the US and the only reason why the US is still functioning is because a lot of the attention that should be focused on the US has been shifted towards obviously Europe and uh, nowadays to the emerging markets but I want to focus more on the US because it's the world's largest economy uh, albeit a phony one but also its implosion is gonna have the biggest effect on basically this globalized economy and also the fact that um, the US uh, in being taken down in this um, collapse is going to affect basically every human being on earth in some way shape form or form now the effects are mostly going to be negative but quite a few people will benefit from this collapse and I'm not just talking about the traders or speculators but let's look at why the um, US economy is in such a perilous state now uh, I must clarify one thing and that when I refer to the US economy I'm basically referring to decisions made by both the government and its central banks and we all know that um, uh, they're in an incestuous relationship um, the Constitution would tell you that the Federal Reserve is meant to be independent of uh, the policymakers but we all know that uh, whatever the policymakers want the, F the Fed or Ben Bernanke will deliver now I'm gonna talk about how people like the easy way out and by which I mean I'm going to use myself as an example um, in this um, crazy uh, chase to get bigger and stronger and becoming a gym junkie I've put on a lot of weight and before summer hits in three months time I have to lose about 15 kilos. Now if I was um, going to use the same methodology as the US government is applying to um, making its economy better, all I would have to do to lose my weight 
is to go on the internet and find myself a miracle pill of which as you know there's millions out there and all I have to do is take that pill and the weight will just disappear overnight I don't even have to raise a sweat now we all know that um, more than half of the world's population is overweight so if you're one of that half I bet you, you you haven't found that miracle cure and I won't either the only way that I can achieve this goal is to do a lot of hard work to diet to up the ante at the gym and do a lot more uh, cardio and basically follow a very strict discipline uh, eating exercising and sleeping regime there's no such thing as a miracle cure but enough of that so that you've got the US economy that was in a perilous state back in 2000 and in 2008 and in both instances the policymakers have decided that the economy cannot contract a lot of bad investments were made as a consequence of bad monetary policy in both cases and it can be very easily argued that one resulted from the other but nobody wanted to do the hard work nobody wanted to experience the hardships of a contraction the government did not want um, a lot of people to go under so there was a lot of bailouts in 2008 and subsequently the economy has never had a chance to flush out all of its excesses and all of these bad investments are still in the system and they're never going to get flushed out as long as the policymakers and Federal Reserve do not understand the concepts of what these excesses are in the first place now let me get back to the cause of all this debacle you've had a lot of loose monetary policy in the 90s by uh, under Clinton and Greenspan now this all this cheap money fueled a stock market bubble uh, more so in the Nasdaq and these dot coms and technology companies a lot of, and these bad investments what we call malinvestments or excesses um, use up a lot of money that should have gone into more uh, productive ventures so imagine um, a company xyz.com that raised a billion dollars in uh, an initial public offering and it used the money um, to I don't know rent office space and purchase other companies and just blow it on executive salaries or do whatever stupid things that they want to do with it and at the end the company never made a profit in fact all it did was spend its IPO money and the coal concept file and when investors wake up um, from their uh, dream and fanciful expectations of uh, a bigger fool buying the stock from them you find that reality sets in and the stock goes to naught but what actually happened was a billion dollars worth of capital has been vaporized and that loss of a billion dollars in the real economy should be major and a billion dollars goes a long way towards uh, building factories um, uh, tooling up current factories um, it could be used to buy productive land or develop unproductive land and a billion dollars goes a long way but instead that billion dollars has been flushed down the toilet and if you understand what money actually is and how money um, must be in a limited but yet uh, defined supply 
the loss of that billion or whatever capital that has gone down the toilet um, should mean that the overall size of the economy has shrunk by a billion dollars and that's just one company you multiply that by hundreds and whatever dozens or hundreds of thousands of bad companies and you should have been facing a huge contraction I mean the Nasdaq went from a thousand to five thousand in, in two years and it dropped back down to below a thousand within the next year you cannot have such a huge loss of money within an economy and not suffer the consequences now the consequences should be first of all high unemployment because uh, a loss of so much money within an economy means that uh, well there isn't enough money to go around and to hire people um, to work in jobs within companies that should never have been formed in the first place I know that's quite a mouthful and also you've got a lot of wasted capital on things that were totally unproductive or money was just wasted it must have been spent on you know fancy cars uh, fancy luxury parties in fancy four hotels whatever it is speak to the executives of Enron they'll tell you all about it but a lot of these ventures were totally phony and it just took a whole bunch of lemmings to bid the price up and to speculate and speculate and things imploded and a lot of people blame the free market for this a lot of people blame greed and the human fear of failure when somebody sees somebody else make money then they they have to make money as well so they jump on the same bandwagon and things get pushed up what a lot of people don't think about is where the money came from and the money came from cheap interest rates very loose monetary policy via the Federal Reserve so if everything was left up to the free market with no central bank intervention you would not have this bubble because the free market would have weeded out these companies in the first place these companies would have never even seen an IPO and a lot of um, capital would have been saved a lot of money would not have been just wiped off the face of this earth and so when when Bush um, won the presidency in 2000 you can say that uh, he inherited the stock market bubble from Bill Clinton and Greenspan and Bush could have done the right thing but no incoming president who wants to be re-elected is going to want to do the right thing he wants to see nominal GDP figures increase he wants to see stock markets at new highs they just they know that if they can provide a magic pill a magic cure for the contraction that was happening and was about to get worse um, they would not get re-elected so what he did with the cooperation of grain span was they just lowered rates even more uh, Bin Laden didn't help and um, the problem was compounded in 2001 obviously so this led to uh, the Fed uh, lowering rates to 1% and they held it there for two years now fueled also with um, bad um, regulatory policies and very loose lending standards this all this free and cheap money or I shouldn't say free all this cheap money then funneled its way into the housing market and basically this housing market this housing bubble is basically a seamless transition of free monies from the stock market bubble in 2000 to this housing bubble of 
2004 through the 2006 where when the peak was and you find that um, uh, the Fed only had one strategy at that point in time and that was to lower rates down to 1% now the consequence of having such cheap monetary policy such loose monetary policy was to create the greatest financial crisis since the Great Depression we all know what happened we all know that the S&P went to triple six and the government uh, the US government and the Fed had to bail out all the banks they had to bail out um, AIG the insurance company they had to bail out uh, all the automakers there was a ton of money that just disappeared off the face of this earth but you know what um, not only did the money come back but it's come back in droves and I'm talking about uh, the money that the Fed has printed on its route to its ultimate destruction the policies that um, the incoming uh, Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke in 2006 um, was far far worse than what Greenspan had ever devised or implemented uh, with the collapse of, of the imminent collapses of all the banks and insurance companies and autos and basically the uh, uh, credit freeze across the globe the Fed uh, in coordination with most of the other central banks around the globe lowered rates and lowered rates and lowered rates and ultimately uh, Fed monies to this day are at emergency rates of zero to point, uh, 25 basis points so despite stock markets reaching all-time highs Fed fund rates are still at basically zero that's going to be telling you something and what it's telling you is that well first things first central bankers don't learn from their mistakes I mean you've got a bubble that occurred from loose monetary policy in the 90s and that bubble imploded that being Techric but the consequence of trying to uh, bolster the economy even worse monetary policy is applied and subsequently an even bigger bubble got blown up that being real estate now that that's blown up what does the Fed do what do what are the policy makers doing well they haven't learned that big budget deficits are a no-go they haven't learned that loose monetary policy are a no-go because all that does is inflate or reflate or inflate old and new bubbles so the government right now is trying to reflate the housing bubble by basically buying up all the mortgages that they are and they're trying to well not trying to they have succeeded in inflating the biggest bubble of them all and that is um, a bond bubble or a uh, sovereign um, treasury bubble ultimately uh, what's what's the outcome from this uh, uh, from these bubbles well you've got to look at first things first the principles that cause these bubbles in the first place you've got to understand um, how this loose monetary policy uh, is causing these bubbles to blow up in the first place I mean it's easy to say oh yeah it's loose money but what actually causes 
all these structural imbalances to occur. Well, I've already spoken about the the bad investments that occur um, when there's a lot of free money flowing around and not too many places to sink them into. So people just make really, really bad decisions. I mean, you've got tech wreck, you've got overpriced homes, but ultimately, uh, you've got to look at why money finds its way into those things in the first place. Now, the, the government and the policymakers have actually got their economic principles all wrong. Their belief in the um, uh, law of Keynesian economics that spending is good and if people don't spend anymore then the policymakers and central bankers have to step in and bolster that spending or encourage that spending and in fact they should borrow and free up money and spend it themselves. Well, if you were to do that as an individual you'd be bankrupted in no time. Now I have used before the example of uh, Joe Blow and Chin Chong, just two blokes. They're on the same income, one blokes. Uh, uh, Joe spends everything he has, he doesn't care about the future, he doesn't save, um, he borrows money and then he get and then he gets he goes out of work and he just borrows um, just to consume. And he's got to a stage where he's so unproductive that he borrows more and more just to pay off the interest on what he has borrowed. And all that borrowing goes into basically uh, unproductive consumption. So holidays, uh, takeout, going to the movies, sports cars, whatever. And then you've got Chin Chong who um, works hard, he saves and he under consumes because he believes that he believes that his savings right now and his under consumption at this point in time is gonna lead to a future level of enhanced consumption through the power of compound interest and the returns of the savings, uh, the returns on investments made through those savings. And as I've said before, to an economist, um, they would look at Joe Blow's economy. There's a lot of consumption. And to this um, Keynesian economist, he would say that Joe's economy is in superb shape. And he would look at Chin Chong's economy and he would say, man, this is just, the, the, the consumption is low and getting lower, he's saving more and more. So this bloke is in a really bad financial shape. And this is where the Keynesian actually have it wrong. Because if you look beneath the surface, Joe Blow is insolvent. There's no way of ever getting out of a debt trap or a debt spiral if one, you're not working, and secondly, you're borrowing more and more just to fuel this unproductive consumption. And with uh, Chin Chong, this guy is planning for the future. He wants to retire, and he doesn't want to worry about uh, his future consumption because he's uh, taken the necessary steps to provide uh, for that future retirement consumption. Now, if you were, if you were to choose uh, who you would rather be, Joe Blow or Ching Chong, it's very obvious who you'd want to be, just in real life. Now, the Keynesians, so you've got the U.S. government and its Federal Reserve, wants to perpetuate a lie that Joe Blow's economy is the is the sound economy of the two. And as a result of instilling all these lies that they have about inflation and um, consumption as being the principal driver of an economy, that's all wrong. And I'd like to take it one step further by actually dispelling that myth. Um, by actually talking about saving. 
and this is where a lot of people um, have got it wrong in fact I can tell you even you yourself watching this video will not have this concept in your mind at all Chin Chong through his savings is actually fueling up the economy and this is something that the Keynesians just don't understand when Chin saves a dollar where does that dollar go? that dollar goes into a bank and that bank either invests the money or loans it out to an entrepreneur or a company uh, as their capital base so that they can make a productive use of that dollar now with the productive use of that dollar uh, uh, the company or whoever has borrowed it is going to make a product and that product is going to sell at a profit that's how the real world works that's that's not just fanciful thinking this is how uh, the free market works so the company makes a profit and the profit is reinvested into the company and the company grows and makes more products and as a consequence of making more and more products at a, a more efficacious pace and having better tools um, the products become cheaper and cheaper and when prices become cheaper and cheaper what does that do? that stimulates demand because when you have cheaper prices it entices the consumer to go out and spend so this all came from the saved dollar and the government doesn't want people to save because if they save they believe that that's taking money out of, out of the economy and that's a total lot of I don't want to um, dwell too much on this but this then leads to another concept that the policymakers are telling a blatant lie about to uh, its people and to everybody ar around the globe for that matter and that is that deflation is bad and that concept even I have had the uh, unfortunate experience of um, uh, passing on the mistruths for many years but deflation is actually a good thing and when it comes to economic principles deflation is a reward for hard work and advances in productivity when you look at the greatest uh, expansion of the US economy that was in the period of uh, 1800s to the 1900s the US economy grew, grew at about what 8% a year for a whole century that's huge China couldn't even achieve this if it tried but enough of that in its greatest expansion of all time what did the US experience for that hundred years what they experienced was deflation for in prices and why did they experience a fall in price well because the free market wants deflation prices should be coming cheaper and prices become cheaper because um, as you have more technological progress and more uh, more improved factors of production better tools better lab more skilled labor better technology you have a greater supply of goods and services so with a greater supply come and uh, you've got a finite number of people prices fall that's just how things work when you have um, demand high and supply low prices go up when you have supply high but demand either stagnant or uh, falling then prices drop and in the case of the states you've got such you had a huge such a huge expansion um, that prices fell for a hundred years 
and I've been um, talking to um, a lot of uh, uh, traders and and people who are in my profession and most of them still don't understand the concept of deflation as being one of great benefit and you've got to look at um, Japan just for argument's sake now we all know first things first what inflation is now inflation for the lay person is just a gradual increase in the in uh, prices of goods and services over time to the more uh, technical economist inflation is an increase in the money supply now deflation is the total opposite of, of what I've just told you so deflation is the gradual fall in price or technically it's a decrease in the money supply and in Japan that they've, they've been suffering deflation for 25 years but to me I don't think that that's suffering at all I've made videos on this before so I'm not going to dwell into it I mean uh, how much are you suffering when the costs of everything that you need to buy just to live falls in value uh, how upset would you be if your phone bill your power bill your water bill your rates dropped with every bill enough of that but deflation is a misunderstood concept and the Fed in perpetuating its uh, propaganda about inflation being good is just covering up the world's eyes about what they're really trying to do but this I'm gonna get onto this a bit later but the concept the concepts that the Fed doesn't understand about saving and the improvement in the economy that comes from people saving means that it decided to print a crap load of money but, but and, and by fixing rates low now it fixes rates low in that it can first of all lower its um, Fed's funds rate so the banks at the rates that it lends to the big banks down to naught or thereabouts and it artificially lowers um, bond rates by buying a crap load of bonds and to this day the Fed still buys and owns over 90% of all long dated US treasuries now all this does is create inflation and I'm talking inflation as in the gradual increase in price we're not even talking about an increase in the money supply because I watched Ben Bernanke in a, congress a congressional testimony saying um, and actually putting a lot more tickets on himself saying that he was the bed f best Fed chairman basically of all time because uh, in terms of uh, inflation because he managed to keep inflation below 2% well he was only able to do that because inflation numbers are bogus in the first place but that's the subject of another video he says that there's no inflation well if he's this smart person that he's supposed to be there is inflation the money supply has increased by what 55 percent in the past four years so you can't tell me that, that there isn't inflation there's 55 percent more inflation than there was four years ago <laughs> Uh, sorry, there, there's 55 percent more money than there was four years ago so there is inflation and inflation is rampant but what uh, or where I should say the inflation is hiding is more a debate for uh, this discussion because the Fed um, says that there's no inflation because the government uh, statistical um, officers um, are doing a really good job of hiding of hiding this inflation through hedonics and uh, other sort of subjective withdrawals of items that have gone up in value or whatever putting more weighting on things that have gone down rather than things that have gone up it's all subject to um, uh, statistical manipulation but as I said that's not the focus of this discussion 
the Fed says that there's no inflation so therefore where's this inflation going and therefore where's the end game well by printing up all this money the inflation is basically being exported to the rest of the world because as you know America being Joe Blow is totally unproductive in relation to the rest of the world Joe Blow doesn't work he just borrows money so the US or the US um, consumer is living well above his means because he or she is spending money that he or she doesn't have on things that he or she really doesn't need whereas the poor uh, uh, worker in China is living below his means because he's working three four times as hard as this American producing all these goods that are shipped over in exchange for pieces of worthless paper now I, I've made videos before about how worthless US treasuries really are and in fact I've used this prop to illustrate um, the plight of US treasuries uh, but when you think about where the inflation is heading you've got um, all these goods and services that are shipped over to the states from China and in return you've got US denominated pieces of um, toilet paper being sent across and so the government is sitting on a mountain of treasuries about two trillion dollars worth um, the the prices are just escalating over in China I mean because things are all priced in US dollars including uh, crude oil and everything else um, when you've printed up so much money and shipped it abroad all that's doing is making prices rise everywhere else and this has now shown up in the emerging markets I mean, you look at India in what a month ago um, the rupee started its uh, death spiral to what a new time low against the US dollar uh, the government put in capital controls I mean limits on gold um, it's just it's crazy you've got the Indonesian rupee falling to a new low uh, because inflation is so rife and I actually think that those countries are the luckiest they're the luckiest because the inflation has shown up first and to the greatest extent so what they can do is dump the US treasuries whilst they still have any sort of value to them and just move on with life and stop shipping things over and I have always, and I've discussed uh, the concept of uh, why people even own uh, US toilet paper and it's not by choice China doesn't want to buy treasuries who, who the hell wants to buy this um this toilet paper you don't but the US doesn't export anything except of course inflation and pieces of toilet paper uh, so they receive all these goods and they ship over um, a lot of these worthless bonds and the um, Chinese officials believe that one day um, when America becomes productive again uh, they can spend those um, bonds onto something more uh, real but that day's not going to come and the reason that uh, I say that that day's not going to come is ultimately what the Fed is doing right now and as I've discussed in um, many other videos you can print money to infinity and you can and I can name one other central bank that did it and this is its currency this is a hundred trillion dollar note from the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe now this thing is a one with 15 zeros behind it 
that note is not even worth the piece of paper that it's written on. That no well, that note is not in circulation anymore. But at the time, it wasn't even worth the piece of paper that it was written on. So yes, if you have a printing press, you can print to infinity. But that's just going to destroy your economy. Because what that does uh, is collapse your currency. And when your currency collapses, every single person living within that system or that economy is going to suffer. And they are going to suffer uh, like they've never suffered before. Because with a, a currency collapse and being a totally non-productive country, you will not be able to import anything because things are just going to go up in price so much that people won't be able to afford anything. You're going to look at, you're going to see price controls, you're going to see long queues at just to buy bread, you're going to all be given bread, you're going to see a lot of um, uh, poverty. Yes, there's going to be some people that's still going to be rich, but that's not the point. I'm talking about the general economy. And printing to infinity, uh, according to the Keynesians, is the right thing to do. But unfortunately, the free market will not allow it. First things first, the free market will not allow the two things that the Fed is doing to go on indefinitely. The first being infinite money printing because your currency is going to be totally destroyed and the result will be $100 trillion notes being floated around and that note will be only used to buy loaves of bread. And all the savings that uh, your grandfather or grandmother um, has worked all their life for will vanish overnight. And everything that uh, you need to buy in life will now look so out of reach because their costs are just going to be well beyond your ability to acquire them. So, as I said, money printing, uh, destruction of your currency, it's an end game. But the other thing that it tries to do is to keep rates low. And keeping rates low to infinity is simply not possible. Because free, free market forces are going to dictate the opposite. Now, take for example... Um, government bonds. Uh, the 10 years trading, it just crossed 3% on Friday or th th Thursday or, or Friday this week. So when you've got a 10 year at 3% and inflation running rife at say 5, 7, 10%, let's just use 10% as an example because that's more a realistic number. Um, to deal with at this point in time with so much extra money being printed. So if China sees that inflation, especially inflation in their country at 10%, what does that tell you about the returns on this toilet paper that they have at 3%? It doesn't make any sense. You're losing money by holding on to this toilet paper. And that's why I call it toilet paper in the first place. And so, uh, all these uh, investors or speculators around the globe are going to look at their pieces of paper and go, hang on a second, this piece of paper is returning 3% 3, 3 but inflation is 10%, I'm losing 7% 7 every year. Mate, let's, let's dump this. So they're going to sell these bonds or these treasuries. And what does selling of treasuries lead to? were an increase in yields. And this increase in yields is going to backfire on the Fed because a rise in yields, a rise in interest rates is going to cause three things. And those three things are going to be spectacular. Now, 
the first um, victim, I, I shouldn't say victim, the first um, biggest implosion, the first casualty of rising rates will be the Fed and the US government itself. The US government would default overnight. Uh, interest rate rises of say, say yields went up to the interest the, the, the rate of inflation 10%. I'm just going to use a nice simple number, 10%. If rates went to 10%, rates went to 20% in the 70s. But, uh, you can't say, oh, sorry, um, in the early 80s. So you can't say that rates can't go to 10% because the historical norm is actually closer to 10% than it is to 0%. So let's just say market forces will push rates towards 10% and the result from that, the first casualty, is the US government. It will default instantly in a nanosecond uh, because the interest on their debt will skyrocket. Now the the US debt right now, I'm looking at a live debt clock, stands at um, sixteen point nine trillion dollars. It just ten percent of that one point six trillion dollars is almost what the government receives in tax revenues. So is the US government gonna spend every cent that it earns servicing the debt that it owes? I don't think so. What? Service your debt or pay out your welfare, spend on the public health system, upgrade roads, whatever it needs to spend its money on, defense, whatever. So you're going to forego all those expenses to pay back, to pay interest uh, on bonds that are actually held by non voters. You're going to be booted out of office within a nanosecond. It's just not going to happen. So, the US government will be the first to fall in the event of a spike in rates. The second uh, casualty or casualties will be the banks. And the, if you thought or if you think that the bank failures or near bank failures of 2008 spectacular you wait till you see what these failures are going to look like in the very near future because every single large bank in the US will implode the stocks will get a zero and they will be sitting on trillions of dollars worth of losses how do you how may you ask is this going to happen very very simple. The banks make most of their money right now, and I mean most, as in I should say all their money, on earning money between the Fed funds rate and whatever that they're lending it out on. So they borrow money from the Fed at near zero percent or between zero and twenty-five. We'll just say twenty-five basis points, and they use that cheap money to buy up. Uh, say bonds so they in fact are lending money from the Fed to give to the government for purchasing their bonds um, or fueling it into other bonds of some other kind and, or into more speculative um, ventures like I don't know more tech companies like Facebook or idiotic companies like Netflix who knows let's just say the bulk of their money the bulk of the bank's capital base is in US treasuries oh, and mortgage-backed assets. So a lot of money is being channeled into uh, housing, bonds and somewhat stocks. So what happens when there's a spike on in, in interest rates and, and, and the Fed has to raise rates to, who cares, 5%? Well, government bonds are only yielding 3%. So the cash flow going from uh, naught to three percent—they're making billions out of that. But what's going to turn? What's going to happen when the cash flow goes from from 
25 basis points to 300 basis points to 500 basis points cost to 300 basis points return. I mean, that's going to instantly turn into a loss overnight. And all the money that they've made will turn into losses. But so the cash flow will turn from positive to negative instantly and all the money that they've made will vaporize overnight and turn into losses. But the more spectacular um, loss will be made from their capital base and that is those bonds and mortgage based assets. And those bonds are just going to be decimated in value which is going to cause uh, these banks to fail because they're not going to have enough capital to remain solvent. And one more um, bit of uh, bad news for the banks at this point in time is not only are they borrowing money from the Fed to buy into these bonds, but they've levered everything up. They've borrowed money on top of that borrowed money to uh, build up even bigger positions in these bonds to increase um, their return. So this is this is insane. I mean, leverage can work for you and against you. So the banks are making millions through leverage, but they're going to lose trillions through leverage working against them. So these guys are going to implode because their capital base, they're going to suffer huge losses and the capital bases are going to disappear. And amongst that capital base, being mortgage-backed assets, is where the third implosion is going to happen as a result of rising rates. And that is the housing market. So you've got the government's going to go bankrupt. You've got uh, banks that are going to go bankrupt. And then you've got the housing market, which is going to implode. Because right now, real estate have only just had a dead cat bounce from its recent lows and are still not going up despite having the cheapest uh, mortgage rates despite having so much free money coming out of the government and Wall Street to try and finance all these uh, loans once again the housing market as soon as rates go up to like, you know, if, if Fed funds rate are at 5% then mortgage rates will be closer to 8 or 9% forget it the housing market will just disappear overnight and this time the losses will be permanent but the biggest effect on the consumer over in the States is the fact that the banks when they go under this time obviously the shareholders are going to get wiped out the bondholders are going to get wiped out but the the hardest the toughest pill to swallow will be the depositors we all know that every cent in every uh, major bank or in every US bank is federally insured but when you've got a government that is bankrupt and a Fed which uh, by raising rates is tightening, there can be no bailouts. There'll be no bailouts of the financial institutions, including the banks, the insurance companies, whatever's out there. And the uh, deposit insurance will not be there. So the depositors are going to be taken out. So people who have money in a US bank, mm -hmm. could buy money. That's a very serious. And this just comes from the market deciding that rates have to go up. And I've discussed before how rates must go higher. And not only because the market's going to dictate it, but in real life, rates are just the price of money. So if you have uh, a lot of demand for money, as in loans, and you've got a very limited supply, i.e. no savings, remember supply and demand? When you've got high demand and no supply, price goes up. The price of money goes up. Interest rate goes up. And the Fed has actually done the total opposite. It's trying to stimulate. This whole theory of Keynesian stimulus means that 
you want to encourage greater borrowing for consumption, no saving, and that's going to lead to a new economic prosperity. Well, that can't happen. If you use the case of Joe Blow and Ching Chong, mate, one guy is destined to die. A very, really, really poor person at a, at a really young age. And one person's going to go on. And what's happening is Joe Blow is actually now borrowing money from Ching Chong to infinity. So if you treat Ching Chong as the Chinese economy, there comes a time where poor Chin's going to look at his balance sheet and go, or his uh, bank balance, and go, man, I'm lending this guy money, but it doesn't seem that uh, he's got any ability to pay it back. So I think I'm going to call this um, whole thing off. I mean, I know I'm not going to get the money that I loaned him back, but you know what? It's, it's better than throwing good money after bad. I mean, the Chinese government must realise that shipping all these goods over to America in exchange for inflation and toilet paper is not a good deal. And so, it, it comes down to what um, uh, I would call uh, the end game for the US, in that it's going to have rising rates, and this will not be dictated by its policy makers or its central bank because we all know where they're heading and that's gonna print to infinity and hold interest rates at naught to infinity. The free market will always dictate the opposite to happen. And one really good question that I'm asked very of excuse me, very often, is Japan's had its rates at naught for twenty five years. So why can't the Fed have its rates for 25 years? Well, that's an excellent question, but it's an actual very simple answer. You see, Japanese people have become very, very wary from the crash back in 89, 88, 89. They had a stock market crash and then a, a, a um, housing market crash. And those people uh, have been bitten and they have now turned into very um, uh, more aggressive savers than ever. They've felt the pain of losing money, so now they're big savers. Not that they weren't big savers in the first place. I mean, you're talking about a country where people uh, are ashamed of losing their job and they lose face if they don't repay their debt. So the Japanese citizen uh, are big savers. And despite the government implementing all these mon loose monetary policy, printing money, printing money, printing money, at, to infinity, but yet the Japanese economy um, has been uh, experiencing deflation for a good part of 20 years. Now, I've said already deflation, you know, decrease in the money supply, it's very easily explained. Whatever money that the government pumps into the system, the, the citizen saves. So, you have falling prices. You, you just have, it's, it's not a question of no demand, because um, deflation actually causes demand to rise. I mean, when you have falling prices, you want to buy something. I mean, if you walk into um, a, uh, uh, a a mile or Grace Brothers and they have a forty percent off, it, it encourages you to spend on buying their overpriced products in the first place. Now, if Myers put up a sign that says "Special Sale Today, forty percent extra," who the hell's going to buy their stuff? I mean, if it costs you 40% more, who the hell's going to demand their products? But yet, that's what the Fed wants you to believe. That rising prices are good for the economy. 
rising prices to me are total crap for the economy and um, if you look at the the Fed's dual mandate in fact it's not a German it's three mandates the first being um, stable prices and based on infinite money printing that's not happening they want to have um, uh, moderate um, rates of uh, other not uh, have um, what's it called uh, 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 sorry they have to have stable prices maximum employment that's right and to try and keep interest rates um, at a steady level for an infinite period of time now maximum employment this is questionable because right now a lot of employment in the states goes to very questionable ventures I mean part-time uh, three-quarters of all the new jobs created are part-time jobs uh, waiting tables or working in cinemas or who knows it's part-time part-time jobs don't pay for full-time mortgages and full-time bills that's what I say but anyway stable prices that's not happening prices may look like they're stable in the states because the CPI uh, is manipulated anyway but the the inflation has been exported to everybody that's been sending them stuff so China Indonesia India wherever they're suffering the inflation over there and their policymakers are gonna have to take a stand against the US government at some point in time by either dumping all their treasuries which is gonna collapse the market even before the Fed even decides to do anything um, or just not ship them anything anymore unless they send them something tangible in return or they send them gold simple as that uh, in the olden days when uh, America was a gold standard and so its currency was backed by gold um, you couldn't print to in infinity because you needed the gold to back up your currency now you've got all these fiat currency which is um, just can be printed to infinity the end game is just inflation and the end game is hundred trillion dollar American notes floating around now although this is a, a Zimbabwean note um, thanks to Larry for this by the way um, you can't you you can't print to infinity because the free market won't allow you to and another point that I'd like to mention uh, is that um, in Japan they've had rates for zero percent I've said this for um, a while back but their government or their economy before they started this policy was in much better shape than the US economy and the Japanese economy I've, I've mentioned this before was based on saving it's based on high productivity it, it manufactures a lot of stuff that it exports overseas in exchange for their imports and in fact Japan uh, uh, if it wasn't for China Japan would be the world's largest creditor nation uh, Japan has what one point about 1.2 trillion dollars worth of um, treasuries that they're sitting on so if they wanted to fund these um, uh, money printing they can just sell all this US toilet paper that they have and they can happily pump that into their economy so their economy is pretty sound and until recently until uh, Fukushima Japan has always had a trade surplus so their government can go ahead and do ridiculous things like print money but it's not gonna have such a disastrous effect on their economy as infinite money printing will have on the US economy because the US is starting from a base of no savings 
a totally unproductive economy. And, and thirdly, you just have uh, this whole belief that somebody is going to perpetually send you stuff in return for your toilet paper. I mean, this is an economy that's ex that's a huge blow up of Joe Blow, multiplied by three hundred and twenty odd million people. Nobody wants to do the hard work. Nobody uh, wants to learn how to save a dollar, learn how to uh, make a dollar, and then save it. Everybody wants a handout. Everybody wants the easy way out. Everyone wants to consume. And therefore, everyone wants to live above their means. And when things are going to implode, uh, the actual biggest uh, benefiters out of the American collapse will be the people that's been sending them stuff in the first place. I mean, yes, they're going to lose a lot of money from the loss of their toilet paper, but those economies will now be able to flourish because instead of sending all this stuff over to the US they can just uh, sell it to other countries they can first of all uh, pay for it in gold or something that is not fiat currency or secondly it's um, because of the the crash in the bond market and subsequently a currency crash the, the, the yuan is going to appreciate like crazy so their own people will be able to afford to afford a lot of the stuff that they couldn't afford before things will now become basically um, cheapest chips for them I mean petrol is going to cost nothing cars are going to cost nothing I mean, these guys are, are going to be living the life that they have deserved for all their hard work but as I was say uh, none of these videos are philosophical discussions this is just the outcome of things so if you have a global colla uh, a collapse of uh, western indebted countries well all the actual credit nations at first will take a hit but in due time they will benefit from the American collapse and the European collapse now um, you, you've got to keep in mind that um, with collapses this time there's no bailouts and the bail and the reason why I said there's no bailouts is who's gonna bail out the government uh, forget even the banks and the housing market and whatever who's gonna bail out the government I mean there's there is <laughs> there is not enough money on the planet to bail out the US government because the debt that they have exceeds global GDP this is a very scary point that um, uh, people normally don't think about uh, when the US implodes uh, most of the world is going to benefit and I'm not saying this because I'm an, Amer um, an American hater or I'm just a philosopher no it just it's just reality because every every Keynesian economist believes that uh, globalization and the world economy needs America in order to function in order to prosper the world cannot prosper without the US prospering well that's a load of bullcrap because what's happening right now it's not the US uh, purchasing stuff with real money or gold or whatever I mean the whole point of um, uh, bartering or imports and exports is that you pay for imports with exports or if you don't make anything you you gotta um, send gold whatever that's not what's happening right now they're receiving stuff and sending toilet paper in return and that that game's going to end. Now, what um, what's actually happening as a consequence? If you think about what I just said, of receiving goods and services, but paying with it with toilet paper, uh, 
that means that the whole world is actually supporting you in the first place. I mean, Joe Blow was actually supported by Chin Chong uh, indefinitely because Joe Blow doesn't work. Joe Blow doesn't produce. So Chin Chong, as soon as he stops lending him money, Chin Chong is going to be much richer. So China, by not sending exports over to America, or if they do, and receiving gold in exchange, they're going to prosper and they're going to flourish. The whole world will become a more prosperous place if it stopped uh, supporting America. And the greatest cost um, to the global economy is actually the propping up of the US economy and somewhat the European economies. Now, if you, if you think, or oh, sorry, if the Keynesians believe that the American economy is the driver of the, the world economy, um, so America is basically the horse and the global economy and the rest of the global economy is the car. And the Keynesians believe that America drives the global economy. And this is actually a very good example that I've been taught over the past many years, is that it's the other way around. The whole world is actually pulling the American economy along. So the, the American economy is actually the cart or the caboose. And the, and the actual world economy is the horse. And this horse is now being flogged to death. And the end game is near. Because this carriage is getting fatter and fatter and fatter and fatter and heavier. And it's getting harder and harder to pull along. So there comes a time when this end game will just happen. And when it happens, it's going to be very quick. So as I said, um, all things aside, um, uh, American economy good, uh, bad. Uh, the Chinese, Japanese economy is um, on much sounder footing. And what you see in um, America has, uh, sorry, what's been seen in Europe will be very soon seen in America. And America would have collapsed potentially a while ago if it had not been for Europe. Um, and Europe has been deflecting a lot of the attention that should be focused on America over to themselves. Because Europe, unfortunately, those 17 countries that signed on uh, to join the Euro, uh, the Eurozone and um, use, adopting the, the Euro as a common currency, um, I've, I've had discussions on, on this before, but they don't have the one thing that America does which could save them or uh, create a quicker death, however uh, way you wish to look at it. And that is, their treaty does not allow them to print money. And by not being able to print money to fund their bond purchases or basically um, fund all, all their public liabilities and keep rates low, their bond rates are actually dictated, or their interest rates are dictated by the market. And that's why you've seen uh, Greece implode because they're not any more indebted now than they were before. It's just that now the creditors are waking up and they're saying, man, these guys are just borrowing to um, perpetuity. I mean, what uh, what are uh, the Greek citizens' ability to repay this debt going to be like in 10 years? And so the lenders or the investors are now, have taken a step back and saying, it doesn't look good at all, so I guess we're going to have to um, sell these bonds. So by selling them, that drove down bond prices, so yields or rates just skyrocketed. You were looking at what a 39% a, a um, 10 year in Greece. And subsequently, every other peripheral country in Europe suffered the, the same um, 
uh, fate as uh, Greece. I mean, bond yields reached uh, multi-year highs in Spain, in Italy, and so the governments were almost bankrupt because they just couldn't afford to service their debt. So the you just can't uh, uh, see that happen in uh, the states because they have a printing press, and their printing press according to Ben Bernanke and the um, Keynesian economists are their salvation but as I've mentioned before um, Zimbabwe had a printing press too and ultimately that's what they're trying to do is print their way to infinity and this is where um, I think ultimately I've been trying to go for uh, the past few months in that uh, it's not a conspiracy theory it's just common sense where America is heading is for what would be a default through inflation uh, or an inflationary default the American government uh, if interest rates were to rise would default overnight they would turn to its lenders just like uh, the Greek government did and just say look man you gotta just um, forgive our debt or forgive part of it just take a haircut so the investors or whoever had the Greek bonds agreed to a deal that uh, was gonna pay them 50 cents in the dollar and that technically is not a default but it's close enough to one uh, when you have to admit defeat and have to take a haircut it beats not getting anything back at all but the US government can't even head that way because uh, it's gone beyond them this debt is so large that it just can't be done if, even if it offered a 50% haircut it's still going to be eight trillion dollars actually it's, not, it's eight and a half trillion dollars just can't do it it just the world just couldn't afford it but what the world doesn't realize is that what the feds doing and printing to infinity is actually worse than an actual haircut because if you print to infinity yes you pay back all your debts that's a good thing but what that means is that the money that you're paid with has no purchasing power at all so would you rather have 50 cents in the dollar or would you have the whole dollar back but that dollar doesn't even buy you what that 50 cents was able to buy you at that point in time in that earlier point in time and me personally I wouldn't like to get involved but if I had to I'd rather take 50% off than having 99% um, of the purchasing power gone away I mean this is this is just a disaster and it doesn't matter from what uh, walk of life you come from it it doesn't matter if you're a, an elderly pensioner with a lot of savings that's gonna be totally wiped out it doesn't matter if you're a, a Joe I shouldn't say Joe Blow but just the the average uh, worker out there you're gonna lose your job because uh, nobody's gonna be able to have, afford anything demands just gonna just diminish overnight uh, I don't know, look, if you're a doctor, you're still going to be able to provide health services, so you're going to live, but the majority of people in the US are going to learn what it's like to live beneath their means for the next who knows how long. It could be years, it could be decades. But the one thing that a lot of people forget or don't seem to understand is that the bigger the boom the bigger the bust you've had tech wreck which was a big boom and it was a bust that was meant to be ha that was meant to happen which they didn't allow that subsequently led to an even bigger boom in the housing market and when that busted it became the global financial crisis and now thanks to the fed you've got the biggest boom of all time this boom involves real estate, stock market, and bonds. This 
you can't get any bigger than this. So when this bus happen, it's going to make 2008 look like just a walk in the park. And me personally, uh, I've been joking around and I've said that they're going to have to rename the Great Depression uh, to the Hiccup because the, the Great Depression is going to be uh, given that, uh, the next the following the near implosion that we're at is going to be called the Great Depression because this thing is not going to last days months weeks whatever this is going to be years if not decades and don't forget the, the Great Depression went from 1929 to what 1946 that was 17 years and this is going to go beyond that simply because it's going to take a long time for America to re-establish uh, its credit worthiness and in order to establish its credit worthiness it has to become productive and to become productive from a totally unproductive uh, economy is, so is something that's very hard to do but anyway I think I've, I've said enough on, um, on uh, the matter today uh, I just want to just um, uh, recap on some of the uh, uh, discussion points that I've um, made is that contrary to Keynesian economics stimulus doesn't work stimulus just causes inflation stimulus has a diminishing effect over time now I haven't gone too much into that because uh, that's the subject of an even longer video but I'm just talking about the direct influence of stimulus and the impact of stimulus on the global economy through inflation is devastating but not just more so to the global economy but to the US economy itself and how this unfolds I've mentioned when it unfolds, I'm not that smart. But ultimately, it only has that pathway. And that pathway cannot be manipulated by the central bankers. For the first time in potentially a, a half a century, the free market is going to take over. And the free market is going to make the decisions for Americans that the policymakers and central bankers could not make in the past 15 years. And these decisions, which will be forced, are going to cause the greatest era of poverty and suffering. Oh, um, and just the level of impo in, impoverishment will be, would probably take America back 150 years. Uh, in terms of standards of living and even on that subject it's evident that standards of living even with all these money being pumped into the system is dwindling and standards of living come from improved productivity when you uh, improve your productivity as in your ability to produce goods and services so prices become cheaper deflation we all know the story um, through improved productivity you grow as an economy because you're able to, to supply more and more goods now if you have no productivity or dwindling productivity you won't grow as an economy so when America was at its most productive uh, this is going back you know 40 50 years you've got uh, oh, women didn't work you had one guy uh, who worked and he was able to support his wife who was at home that he was able to save money and he was able to raise two three four five children in total comfort Go back to the 60s and 70s and watch things like the Brady Bunch or that 70s show or 
whatever TV show that relates to that uh, point in American history and you can see the exact thing that I'm explaining to you now and that one guy worked supported his whole family and had enough saved for retirement and enough to help out his kids with their college education and so forth fast forward to modern America and I don't think that uh, the average um, American family can afford to just have one working parent. So you're on two income families and if one person loses their job, they lose the house. Uh, most American families can't afford to have you know, three, four, five kids. So what does that tell you about the standards of living um, over the past few years or past couple of decades? it's all thanks to the feds um, when I say feds it means the past Federal Reserve um, uh, chairman and for from poor fiscal policies by the policymakers and you've got a recipe for just total um, disaster you've got already dwindling standards of living you've got uh, running away, uh, runaway inflation. You've got uh, a central bank that just wants to print to infinity, so that their debt will be meaningless, and they can repay their debt through inflation. And they just hope that they can achieve it before the people, the holders of their toilet paper decide that enough is enough we're just going to sell this stuff so uh, we all know that the Fed's not keeping its mandate because they're not keeping prices stable and the full employment is just a joke because we're nowhere near that and thirdly to hold interest uh, to um, hold interest rates at a moderate level for infinity is definitely not what they're doing because all I've seen from this Fed chairman is 0% for the past 5 or 6 years now the implosion you just have to brace yourself for it because when this thing starts it's gonna snowball and it's gonna snowball quicker than, than the GFC it's gonna fall quicker than tech wreck it's gonna fall quicker than the uh, crash of October 1987 Remember the Dow lost 23 percent that day, and even in tech wreck, that that didn't happen. Even in the GFC, you never saw the stock market lose 23 percent in one day. But in this instance, it will. And ultimately, the US dollar will probably be like this note, and it will be taken out of circulation because it won't be accepted around the globe anymore. That's going to be a tough pill to swallow. But I guess the Keynesians don't want to lose weight the hard way. They want the magic pill. And that magic pill, as most of us know, doesn't exist.